All right, we are live. Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody? Um, so as we kind of let our members get signed in, those types of things, we would like to welcome you to our, at least I think this is our third live update. Yes. Your GAE Vice President, Lisa Morgan, as well as yours truly, uh, GAE Secretary Treasurer, Justin T. Johnson. And so um, I guess, Lisa, we should just go through our quick introductions again so that we may have, hopefully we have a lot more people on with us today. Yes, I am Lisa Morgan. I am a kindergarten teacher in DeKalb County, and I am currently GAE Vice President. I am Justin T. Johnson, middle school business education teacher in DeKalb County, and I also have the pleasure and honor of serving as the Secretary Treasurer of the Georgia Association of Educators. And today, we um, brought along with us our lobbyist, Mr. Joe Fleming, as well as what you will see on your screen or who you will see on your screen, a special guest that we will have with us later on um, in today's segment, Mr. Stephen Owens. Um, and so, um, Joe, if you would like to introduce yourself uh, quickly for us. Sure. I'm honored too to represent GAE at the State Capitol and before the Board of Education. Um, and uh, excited but will be challenged by the upcoming conclusion of the General Assembly, which appears that it'll begin in person on June 11th, although committee hearings, including committee hearings on education and the budget, have already taken place, some in person and some online. Okay, and okay. Stephen, we have not forgotten about you. We will introduce you as soon as um, Lisa does her part. So take okay. it away, Lisa. All right, so, and as Joe said, there are, in-person committee hearings about education that have begun happening. And if you are a GAE member, Joe sent you a legislative alert with an update of, with the information about the Subcommittee on Education of the Senate Appropriations Committee and their meeting, which was held yesterday. So if you did not get that email, get in touch with us to make sure that, that you are receiving those emails because there was great information in there about how the pre-K program may be cut and TRS information, Professional Standards Commission information, and the Georgia Department of Education. One thing, the good news, we want to have some good news for you that we want to point out is that the Professional Standards Commission has eliminated the Ed TPA requirement for teachers to become certified for the first time, which is great for our students and our early career educators. And one of the things they pointed out about that elimination is the fact that teachers were paying over twice as much as nurses in testing in order to become licensed in our state. So once again, our teachers were paying more just for their career. So that's great news that that has been reduced. And we want to, as we introduce Dr. Owens, we want to make sure that if you have questions about the state budget or the information that you're hearing about the state budget, he's here to answer them. So I'm going to ask those of you who are watching now to please type those questions in so we can see them so we can get you that great information. Yes. So today we do have with us uh, Dr. Stephen Owens. Um, Stephen is a senior policy analyst at G G GBPI, uh, where he focuses on state policies and research that affect public K through 12 education here in Georgia. Uh, prior to joining GBPI in 2018, Stephen was a research and data analyst at the Georgia Department of Education. He created data visualizations to help district and state policymakers better understand school outcomes, assisted in the creation of Georgia's plan to implement federal education legislation, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, and produced analyses 
that shaped public policy for Georgia schools. Stephen graduated from the University of Georgia, where he holds a doctorate with a focus on education policy. His dissertation Dogs. centered on state level agenda formation. Um, so here we have Stephen Owens with us, Dr. Stephen Owens. And as our vice president asked you earlier, please, please, please make sure that you ask those questions um, as we will serve as your moderators today and just give you an opportunity to hear it straight from the professionals. So Stephen, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I also, before we jump into the nitty gritty of the budget, uh, I just wanna say thank y'all for the work you're doing and to any educators, leaders, school staff uh, that are watching this or will watch this in the future, just know as a, as a parent that we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, we're nonpartisan. Uh, we, we're a nonprofit organization advocating uh, to expand the pie here in Georgia so that more Georgians can, can thrive and participate in the economy. And we know that K-12 public schools is a huge part of that as an investment in the citizens and the people of the state of Georgia. And that does not happen without the work that y'all do day in, day out. And I know that it cannot be easy in this forced transition to online and remote instruction and what that looks like over the summer. And so I just wanna start by saying thank y'all for having me and uh, to, to those of y'all working in schools to, to make the best of this. Thank you sincerely um, from me as a parent and from us at Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Okay, so um, Stephen, we actually, is it okay if I call you Stephen or? Oh, absolutely, yeah, bring it on. All right. So um, Stephen, we do have a first question. Um, our members and our followers are like coming out with them today. I love evening engagement. So the first question, is what is the update on the legislation to expand gambling in Georgia? Back in March, the House Resolution 378 was mentioned. At a time when we are needing revenue in the state, now seems like a good time. That's an interesting question. Um, and one that I, I would be surprised if the legislature took on any significant policies outside of passing the budget and a couple of uh, hot topic issues that I think that they've signaled they want to pass a hate crimes uh, law. You know, we're one of the only states in the union that doesn't have one of those. Um, and the discussions around the budget have taken so much of the oxygen out of the room. Um, the idea that there would be then kind of large significant movement on gambling uh, stretches the imagination. It's possible. I mean, at GBPI, like, uh, we we always kind of gone at gambling from this perspective that if it's done right and it's a net good for the state of Georgia, um, that it needs to be kind of taken care of very carefully in that way. Um, and the idea of kind of shoehorning a part of gambling for education, like we just don't have that ability in the state of Georgia. It would just be additional funds in the state coffers. Um, and it's it all comes down to the legislation, whether or not the state would make any money on it at all, um, depending on what the enabling legislation goes into that. And so I have no inside information um, on gambling. Thankfully, there are some other revenue options that um, state leaders have seemed to be interested in um, that look like they might get some movement this year because of where we are in the novel coronavirus. Okay, um, expanding off that question, um, <laughs> I, gambling, yes, would be a big change in Georgia. Are there other ways that we might see looked at to increase revenue instead of just cutting, cutting, cutting? Yeah, and so my colleague who writes on budget and taxes, Daniel Canzo, wrote a great menu of options for ways to raise revenue um, and was able to easily come up with $1.3 billion in additional revenue. And so I'll list a few of them really quickly. And one of them that's gained the most traction is the idea of uh, lifting the tobacco tax. We have the second lowest tobacco tax in the, in the United States. And when you take into account all the money that we spend um, fighting the effects of smoking in the state of Georgia and now vaping, it, it's more like we are subsidizing <laughs> smoking than we're getting any funds from that. 
So if the state of Georgia were to raise the tobacco tax up to the national average, uh, about $600 million would enter into the state coffers. And that, is, that would help uh, fill some of these budget shortfalls in schools that would help um, with our rural health care providers that are struggling right now, that could do a lot for the state. So, so that's one that, that we lift up and that I, a lot of people on both sides of the aisle have talked very favorably about um, raising that tobacco tax and subsequent taxes on vaping products, which I know teachers are very passionate about. Um, and then there's a few corporate loopholes, uh, tax loopholes that could be closed. The state could change the the double deduction, which is this pretty rare thing nationwide that only uh, helps on average Georgians making about $240,000 a year or more. Um, so there's these kind of easy or more common sense ways to raise revenue so that we don't have to endure what would be one of the most devastating year by year cuts Georgia public schools has ever seen. Um, during the Great Recession, the uh, state cut about $1.4 billion from K-12 schools. If we did a 14% cut across the board, we would actually have a larger cut than that just next year. And that's on a budget that begins in six weeks. Um, and so it, we can no longer just kind of hypothetically consider, oh, what could we possibly do to raise money? We, we need to get into the serious work of looking at these really kind of common sense ways and uh, if you go to gbpi.org, you can find that menu of options. Um, but the tobacco pack tax, I think, is getting the most runway right now. Thank you, Stephen. Um, since Lisa brought up the topic of revenue, uh, we actually have another good question. Um, yes. So the question is, why is the legislature considering cutting pre-K funding when pre-K funding comes from the lottery and lottery revenue hasn't decreased? That's a great question. Y'all have knowledgeable listeners <laughs> and members. Good educators out there and supporters. Yeah, of <laughs> y'all are following the budget docs. Um, I think just because the instructions came down from leadership and uh, from the governor and from leadership appropriations, that 14% cuts, that's, that's the number across the board, um, that that kind of forced the Department of Early Care and Learning's hands in like showing those cuts. The important thing is to note that these are not the final budgets. And um, in an appropriation hearing a couple of weeks ago, um, the director of OPB, that's the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, said we're, we're going to know the true extent of the cuts uh, once we have better figures and June 1st is when we'll get updated numbers. And to that uh, person's question, there's a chance that uh, pre-K might not have to take a hit like that. They have significant lottery reserves. Uh, they may be able to kind of weather the storm for the first year, but I think uh, leadership wanted to be careful about making sure to prepare for the worst and then maybe kind of supply those funds if they sit there. But you're right, that's in a completely separate pot of money that has been doing um, quite well for, for good or for ill. The lottery has done quite well. Okay, we have another question from one of our members that's watching and she says she wants to know if should our public schools continue back to online in the fall, will there be funding to help our teachers learn how to effectively teach online? That's, um, that is actually one of my nightmares as a former teacher is uh, perfecting your craft <laughs> in person instruction and being in the pedagogy changing uh, midway. I can say that the federal government passed uh, significant funds down to K-12 schools in Georgia and across the United States. Uh, for schools, this will be about $411 million. And it's meant for that exact purposes. What are the additional costs that come with this forced online instruction, uh, meal preparation, hazard pay, cleaning of buildings? Whether or not the buildings open or when they do, I think a lot of that is going to come down to district by district decisions. The state of Georgia places a, the onus a lot of time on those individual districts to make these decisions with good guidance from the state, but it still comes down to that unit, that school board and superintendent making the decisions. Um, and then I think similarly, they're going to have a lot of flexibility on how to spend that money in what's called the CARES Act. Um, will that be professional development for teachers? Will that be Chromebooks or trying to outfit more buses with Wi-Fi? 
I think one thing I've seen by talking to a lot of school leaders is that there's no, uh, there's no short list of needs. That if this is something that stays with us yeah. for a while, then $411 million is not going to do it. Um, and I, in conversations I've had with, with teachers and principals and superintendents, that it, we are, we're doing a good job of making this transition to online instruction, but this is not the panacea of efficient education. There, there is something lost here, which I think is important that as teachers feel that, that they're not going crazy. There, there's something lost in this transition. And so that, that federal money can be used for that. We'll see if any more federal money comes down the pike. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and, and also, if I can just add my personal opinion there or thoughts, I also think it's important that um, school districts actually invest in learning and behavior management systems um, so that, I mean, shout out to all of the educators who just were winging it for the last eight to nine weeks via Zoom, um, you know, a platform that was like, okay, let's take to this real quick. So definitely, um, you know, I think there has to be an investment there. Um, I'm going to go to one of our next questions here. Um, Emily Robinson, I will actually come back to yours. I think Lisa and I can probably uh, talk a little bit about that one. Yes. Um, Courtney Alexander says, would legislators be willing to stop testing for next year to save funds? Um, as we talk about toxic testing, testing, high stakes testing, all of those things, would legislators be willing to stop that testing for next year in order to save some of that funding? I think anything is up for grabs. I, I think that there's a lot of legislators who saw the way the pendulum swung in the past 20 years towards high stake testing. And they saw and they heard from your members and from Georgians and parents across the state that saw that this is, uh, this is a very large burden uh, put on children. And so the way the Department of Education acted quickly in the state of Georgia and then at the federal level to give waivers for testing, if there is still a significant disruption next, this coming fall and the spring, I, I, I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. The hard thing for me as a researcher is that while I, I see the damage uh, the testing is done by trying to limit all of schooling into, you know, like one day of testing, it's also one of the only ways we know, like how are all the kids doing in the school? How are our students with disabilities doing? How are English language learners doing? And that isn't to say that high stakes testing is the answer, um, but it, it is hard to imagine having two full school years where we just, we, we really don't know. Um, and so I think that would take a lot of vulnerability between the state and districts to be able to uh, work together just to make sure that all students are being served well and, but also not falling into the mistake of saying that tests are the only way to measure a school or a student's ability or their worth in the classroom because I think we've all seen um, how that has gone too far. So I, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. I know there are a lot of stakeholders who are nervous about the idea of not only one year of testing, but two years of testing being lost for that exact reason. How do you measure equity? I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I think we all can agree that um, testing is not a favorite of any educators to discuss. Um, so the next question we have, I think is started by a comment, but I think there's a question in here that perhaps you can answer. Um, P12 doesn't need to cut. We can move money away from, I think he means higher education by 4% and it will cover 1.5 billion short from P12. Um, online learning is not equally available to all of Georgians because rural Georgia has less than 50% availability to broadband. Um, do you see that that might be something considered? Because we do know that rural Georgia is going to bear the brunt of these cuts because they are less able to make up the lack of state funding with their local property tax values. So do you see any things happening there? Um, I, I appreciate that question because it gets to the heart of if you ever just treat cuts as this across the board, let's be equal to all districts, that is inherently unequal. Because to your point, the further you get away from the Metro Atlanta donut, um, 
and especially the more rural and sparse the district is, they just don't have the property tax values to be able to make up the difference. During the Great Recession, we actually saw property values fall in Metro Atlanta at the same time that there were strict cuts um, outside of Metro Atlanta. So it ended up equaling out. Everyone felt, felt it terribly the same. Uh, this, this will not be the same uh, recession. We, we have no reason to believe that property taxes are going to fall like that. And so there will be a much bigger gap between the have and the have not districts if we try to do that one kind of cut across the board. And I, I understand that reader, that uh, person's questions of like, okay, what are, what are the other parts of the budget that we can um, kind of find in order to keep K-12 schools whole? And I'm right there with them because this is an investment. I, I do think that for one year, the fact that the districts I've talked to, there are a lot of districts that have reserves that will be able to kind of weather a storm without making cuts for this year where the big fight is gonna happen next year. But I think it's important for all of us to realize that the state of Georgia just spends so little per citizen as a government compared to other states. We have a very, for such a prosperous and growing state, we have a very high ceiling of the amount of revenue we could raise where we then wouldn't have to pick off from higher ed or from healthcare or from defects in order to keep one area whole. There's ways that we could uh, just grow the pie so that all of these, we can do right by all of these areas because K-12 isn't gonna be the only one that's hurt. I mean, we have hospitals that are closing right before the coronavirus and we have kids stuck in the defect system who are going to go into larger, larger caseloads. And I know that the teachers understand their place in the ecosystem of the community right alongside defects workers, right alongside healthcare workers, the lights have decided to come back on. I guess I had a good idea. Um, but I, I do think that there's ways to like raise revenues where we can do right by all of these areas without having to think about, okay, what's the other area we pick from? Because I mean, we're spending less before the coronavirus, we were spending less per citizen in state services than uh, 2008. So like we, 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 we are falling backwards as we're a growing state and we're spending 3% less per person after 11 years of economic growth. Uh, we, we can do better is what I'm trying to say. So thank you so much, Stephen, for that response. Um, one of the things that we've found, especially like as soon as budget cuts started, um, districts started dropping the F-bomb. <laughs> furloughs, <laughs> right? Um, and so the thing is, is that we notice is District A is talking about, they're considering 10 furlough days. And District B, which is right next door, is saying no furlough days or four furlough days. And so um, the question here is, can legislators request transparency um, in budget spending across the state um, so that we don't have one district doing it totally different than the other, um, especially um, when we think about neighboring districts where teachers, we talk about teacher retention and recruitment um, because that's definitely going to affect those two factors. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. I grew up in Clayton County where like once I, once we moved, I think like two miles across the county line to Fayette County, you might have a completely different tax base yep. and you're crossing over an arbitrary, like an invisible line. And that could be the difference between 20 furlough days and no furlough days at all because of that ability to have property taxes. I do think that legislators have that ability, that kind of bully pulpit to be able to say, you know, show us what you're doing. Um, but as long as we have a, a system that funds schools that relies on like 40, 45 percent of your budget comes from local taxes, then a lot of school districts end up their hands being tied. That, that they might be able, they would say, we don't want to do this either. But unless there's more funds coming from the state, then we're stuck. And I think that a lot of uh, school leaders right now are, to your point, dropping the F bomb because they want to be able to prepare for the worst. And then if it turns out the state does have additional money uh, for districts, then they can say, okay, we don't have to furlough you this many days. Um, but as long as we have a system that relies on like the zip code you live in 
for the quality of education, we're always going to have those kind of inequities that you described, where you can live two miles away from Clayton and Fayette, and, and it could be thousands of dollars difference between the student. Um, and so I, I, I want to have sympathy for those school district leaders who are trying to make this work with just the, with a, with a system that's been given to them. Um, and and then taking that to state leaders and saying this is this is the this is the responsibility of the state. You need to make this whole. This is this is written as a state constitutional responsibility uh, that and that you need to be able to make up the differences between these two um, tax uh, tax values. Yeah, that's so true because we see where educators. Um, we've heard stories, Lisa and I both, of where educators who are right there at that thirty years are just leaving the profession because of the risk of going into furloughs, those types of things. So even before districts kind of know that final say, just even the rumor of them have literally scared educators to say, you know what, I'm gonna leave the profession at this time. And we can't continue to have that happen and not replace those teachers. Or right. even those great teachers leaving before their quote unquote time, there's still many years left in them. Absolutely. Stephen, I had a question, if, if it's okay. Um, back a couple of appropriations, uh, joint House and Senate Appropriations Committee meetings, uh, the National Conference of State Legislators testified. And I, and I may not have gotten this right, and maybe you can help me understand and, and see how this may play out. But within the CARES Act, there's the, I believe, Corona uh, Relief Fund, which apparently was four, over $4 billion to Georgia and localities. Although I believe it was said on the call that the money can only be used for health and COVID related um, expenditures and not to fill in uh, gaps in the state budget. But the, the presenters on the call indicated that there might be some effort in Congress to kind of loosen those um, restrictions on, on the use of that money. Um, do you have any update or insight? Oh, and she also mentioned litigation for that matter, I believe. But do you have any insight on what may have, may become of that money? Has it been sent to the state already and it's just being set aside? I think that there's a lot of ideas on where that money could be used, but to your point, it reminds me a lot of Title I funds. So a lot of the people who are following this know that idea of supplement, not supplant. So this, this is funds that can go to an additional thing. It can't fill what wasn't already a, a state expenditure and it needs to be spent pretty quickly too. Uh, the funds that went to schools in the CARES Act, that 411 million, uh, I think they have until next September uh, to spend that funds, uh, those funds, but the state does not have that with the 4 billion that you're talking about. And so there are a lot of ideas. I mean, we've heard discussions of expanding broadband. Um, I haven't heard any kind of concrete answers to where those are, where those funds are going to go, and 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 it was truly remarkable how quickly Congress passed that and w was able to send that down to the states. And kudos to them. But to your point, I think that there uh, it left a lot of senators and House reps uh, wanting to make sure that they got it right, like what you talked about with the flexibility or the way that we saw the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education, say that oh, this CARES Act. For, funding for schools actually needs to be sent, more of it needs to be sent to private schools. I, I think that there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisles who say, we need to make sure to get this right and tighten it up or provide flexibility kind of above what happened in those emergency sessions. And we'll see, I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't think we're past the time of federal funding for states because as much as it's easy to posture that maybe some states should go out of business, that is, that is not a good way to operate a country. And like Georgia has quote unquote done everything right. We have a strong teacher pension system. We had a great rainy day fund, $2.7 billion. And we've also gone to our con congressional leaders and said, there needs to be more funding here. We need to be able to keep our school districts whole. This is a fraction of what schools got. Um, during the uh, Obama administration with the ARRA funds that also included Race to the Top. I mean, that was about $1.6 billion. And right now, K-12 schools are dealing with about $400 million. So I, I don't think it's crazy to say that there will be additional discussions about 
funding and just kind of how it should be spent. Hopefully it'll happen before June 30th. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. Um, we did have another question about testing and um, just want to let the person that asked that know this Facebook Live will be our, it will be on our YouTube and on our page because we did address that a little bit earlier. Didn't want you to think that we were ignoring you. So when we finish, go back and look because we did discuss that testing. Seems like quite a few educators have that same idea of let's just throw out the test for next year too. So. It's hard. If you've, been, if you've been told for years that the culmination of your job is to uh, show up on a test. <laughs> Um, and now we have kind of this historic disruption to the capital T test. I completely understand the people who say I, that I, I don't need to be measured um, by an inaccurate measure. <laughs> and, and because this is going to be felt a lot different in Hancock and Doherty counties than it might be up in Floyd or, or Versailles, because of that, I completely understand the teachers saying that like, I, I can't be put, pitted up against this completely different scenario across the state of Georgia when right. kids are going to arrive, let's say schools start a normal time in the fall, they're going to arrive with a lot more than what they left school with. Uh, and, so, and some of that might be reinventing the way that we learn, you know, I, I want to believe those kind of rainbows and butterflies views, but a lot also there are going to be a lot of kids that have dealt with food insecurity um, and who have been in households that are unstable and they are they're missing out on those interactions with adults like you um, who can be able to step in and tell them that you're valuable and that you are safe here. And that we're going to feel the effects of that. I mean, that's, that's just a reality. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, so that will actually probably, now that you're saying like kind of revisiting school and going back to school, um, we had a question earlier about, um, and it's one of those things where sometimes we think it's far fetched, but, it could happen. Um, you know, so it's saying the question is about what should we do if students get into a fight at school over masks? I can see this happening. Some students will not wear masks and other students may get upset at them and vice versa. Um, personally for me, I can see, you know, I would, when I'm going out that once or twice during the week, I'm wearing my mask and others are looking at me like, dude, why do you have that thing on? And I'm like, why do you not have yours on? So those types of things, you know, um, Lisa, if you want to kind of have some input on that as well um, into our personal experiences. Yes, and that's one of the things, as this educator said, I can see that happening really quickly in a classroom situation. Um, even young children to high schoolers, we've all experienced where children are teasing or going a uh, bullying at the most extreme levels over simple things and the masks and all those other things, I think we have to look at that. Um, but I also think we really need to, as educators, be watching our local board meetings, watching our local districts to see what their plans are and to see how some of this might be mitigated. And I think our leaders and our local school boards are going to have to get creative mm -hmm. with how we go back to school. We know there are CDC guidelines um, for what needs to happen if it's practical, but that's going to require funding to be practical. That's going to find um, some discipline of teachers and students to make it happen. And it's also going to have to perhaps to be some revisioning of what happens. Um, I read earlier today, the Milwaukee City Schools is considering a virtual option where older students would remain learning virtually and elementary students would be back in the buildings, but they would spread those students throughout all of the buildings so they could better social distance I'm guessing under the theory that the older students would better, better be able to handle virtual learning. And obviously the older students, high school students could be left at home during the day. Um, but we're going to have to look at some of those creative ways. And we as educators are gonna to have to be watching and monitoring what our boards are saying. 
And listen, yeah. I'll go ahead and say this too, because you were you were saying using very key words there, being practical and creative. Um, but we also want to let school districts, and there are some in particular, um, I won't <laughs> call out any, but being practical and 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 realistic, those types of things, increasing class sizes is not the way. <laughs> um, you know, we're hearing stories of school districts saying we're going to increase class sizes as well as furlough days. That's not it. I'm thinking, well, we've been talking about how hard it would be to social distance in our classrooms with our current class size right. out. Okay, so um, we do have some more people now asking some more questions. Justin, I don't know if you've noticed. Um, and this is one that I hear a lot about. Um, would the legislature consider letting teachers retire at 25 years with the 30-year benefits? So the question is, would they get the 30-year the multiplier after 25 years? Yes. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to be short on this one and say no. I mean, I could be surprised, <laughs> um, but I, but I think that apart from the, the financial implications, a lot of the legislature, legislators I've talked to who've been in and around schools just see the value of experienced legislators so much. The idea of incentivizing early retirement is just heartbreaking. Um, and that isn't to take away from any individual decisions. Um, but one of the reasons the state of Georgia had to pay more into TRS in the years after um, the Great Recession is because of the number of teachers uh, who retired early or who left the classroom and didn't come back. I mean, that's just less people paying into the system. And that's one of the reasons that when we talk about a GBPI, um, Cut, trying to cut your way out of a recession. It, it's just absolutely silly because cuts to education, while that sounds theoretical, I mean, that's teachers being fired. That's 80 to 90% of your um, school district budget is going to salaries and benefits to the professionals inside the building, and the vast majority of those are teachers. And if you say, let's just cut 14%, that's a lot of neighbors and friends and people you go to church with and people you see around your park who now are out of a job or might not, you know, might not be able to make that same money um, or into a, um, a workforce with soaring unemployment. So this, any sort of these big dangerous cuts are gonna be felt for years because it'll just kind of continue and worsen any recession we're in. Um, if, if we're cutting thousands of teachers and cafeteria workers and bus drivers, that's just going to, that's going to hurt our state for years to come. And, and that's no way to get out of a recession by, by making things worse, especially the further you get away from Metro Atlanta, because a, a, a teacher's paycheck and a, a educator and leader's paycheck goes further, the further you get away from Metro Atlanta, that's, it's a, a more equitable paycheck if it's the same dollar amount. And so that's one of the reasons that we're so adamant about like trying to fight against that idea of okay let's just make some quick cuts and then get past this no these are people and, and these are people that are taxpayers and and we need to invest now as hard as it might seem Stephen, i'm glad you mentioned um because oftentimes most of our conversation or we hear a lot about classroom teachers um, and so i'm extremely proud that you mentioned um, our education support professionals, because they will be um, equally, if not more, um, affected by these cuts. Um, I want school districts to understand that we, even at GAE, understand the importance of our pair of educators, our nutrition staff, our custodians, our office staff, our psychologists, everybody, our education support professionals are as equally or more important um, because Lisa and I are classroom teachers. And so we can't do what we do best without them doing what they do best. Um, so our bus drivers, everybody, and as Lisa and I mentioned last week, and Lisa kind of brought this up, is school bus drivers checking temps, you know, on the school bus before, Can you, imagine? you know, the kids get there or 
you know, they get on the bus, they have, they don't have a temperature by then, but they get to the school and then, you know, you got to stop instruction in order to like shut the school down essentially. So yes, I'm glad you addressed that. Um, Cause we've had some questions from our ESPs um, here on this and Lisa and I can actually speak to those um, once we are kind of done with our uh, GPBI uh, platform. Yes, and one thing I want to point out for, um, we had another person ask the question, um, it's been in the media, I'm sure most of us have seen it now, that some of the state senators said they didn't want to do the F word, they wanted to do a worse word, um, they wanted us to work the same amount of days, and, um, but cut the salary, which when especially we, the ESP is the first one that jumps to my mind then because if we have the F word days, um, they'll probably be at the beginning of the year or the end of the year. And most of our ESPs already work second jobs. So on those furlough days, they could work their second job and try to recoup some of what they've lost. But if we just do a deduction, which was the word that was used from our pay. Um, those people obviously can't make it up, but would we ever get back to that point where we are now if that happened? Uh, that's a great, and I think thankfully no school leader worth their salt is going to consider what you just described. <laughs> I, I, I think they would be run out of town with pitchforks and flame if they suggested teachers just need to work the exact same amount uh, for less pay without in entertaining for low days. And um, yeah, that's, that's the hard thing is that the state of Georgia has for the past few years, and I think Governor Kemp has made a, a concerted effort to reach out to teachers and education leaders as a profession. And that is a relationship that I think benefits everyone. Um, school, having state government um, and the people who implement school and schooling be on the same footing is going to be best for everyone. And I'm not going to say it's perfect here. Um, and I understand senators asking that because, you know, you want to get the, the same output with less money. Um, but thankfully, a lot of those, all those decisions fall to school leaders who understand that's not something they can ask. Um, and if they do ask them, then that's why we have democratically elected school boards. Um, because we need, we need to do right by all of our professionals in the classroom and recognize that like a loss is a loss and not treat it as something other than that. Okay. So we've had a lot of great information today. Thank you so very much. I'm looking back through, um, and I think that's, unless someone else pops us up a question real quick. I just want to, um, Joe, if you want to add anything um, during this. No, Stephen was super gracious in his praise of GAE, and I, I that means a lot to all three of us and all of our yeah. members, and I appreciate that. And I just want to, uh, put a shout out to uh, to GPBI. Please visit their website. It's uh, gpbi.org. There's so much uh, helpful information there. They do a great job on, uh, they have a whole higher education section, of course, on the budget, uh, uh, K through 12 education. They do a great job. So I uh, thank you for being with us, Stephen. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, and well, I'm happy to be here. Y'all are the y'all are the ones out in front. I, I'm singing back up here. Y'all y'all, <laughs> I'm I'm harmonizing y'all's work. So no, I, I I'm I'm happy to be like I know that we're happy to be partners with y'all and to uh, continue to work because because we're all heading the same direction. Like, we all want to do right by Georgia's kids, and I think that this is a big part of that. And organizations like this, uh, y'all are are a huge part of doing right by them. So thank you. I hope to see you again soon. Mask on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. One of the questions that we did have um, from one of our ESPs was, um, in particular, um, here in the state, we do recognize our Georgia Teacher of the Year. And so this is kind of one of those conversations that we've been having um, and moving that forward through legislation. Um, but when will Georgia 
recognize support staff as they do teachers. Um, so for instance, a support staff of the year. And Joe, if that's something you wanna chime in with, um, or Lisa, anybody, um, you know, we can just kind of have a little small, co quick conversation on that as well. Boy, if there's ever a year to do it, this is it. Yes. Um, and, and I've had discussions with the Department of Education about doing that. I, if I recall correctly, the Teacher of the Year is, is a process that begins in the summer, is that right? Um, I'll have to double check on the timing of that. Yeah. We have had discussions with DOE about uh, an ESP of the year, and they were very favorable to it. Uh, and I'll make sure to follow up with them ag again this week. Okay, Joe, let me ask you this, because I know that recognizing an ESP of the year is one of our legislative priorities. Mm -hmm. And my question for our members, would that require legislative action? Or could should our members mention that to their legislators, because I think perhaps, Justin, you're right, this year might be the year that um, that get gesture of goodwill might be quickly coming um, from the legislature if that is what it takes. So should our members that have that relationship with their legislators talk to them about that? It certainly doesn't work. Um, I don't think it requires a legislative act. I think it's something that the Department of Education can undertake on their own. Um, and again, they were they were um, they agreed that it was a, a, a thing worth pursuing. And I, I'll follow up, follow up with them on the timeline of the reg, of the regular Teacher of the Year process and, and see if we can dovetail an ESP of the year into that. Um, of course, for our ESPs, it may be good to do what uh, uh, I think it was Illinois did in naming every teacher a Teacher of the Year. Uh, I think all of our ESPs have done a remarkable job right. delivering food, driving, uh, keeping the buildings uh, sanitized and clean. They're just remarkable work. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll follow up on that and let you guys know. Okay, okay great. Um, Justin, I think we have um, may have gone over what we had planned to be a uh, short yeah. Facebook Live tonight, but um, I feel like we've had a lot of great information for our members. And I hope that they will not only watch tonight, but share with others in their community, share with all the members and go back to our YouTube page and our Facebook page and share this with the rest of the community, knowing what's coming June 11th when the legislature goes back. Oh yeah, this is definitely going to be a collective effort. Um, I'm glad you said that, Lisa. It's going to be educators, parents, um, even our students, um, those students who are old enough to email or contact, having them send those emails um, on how these things, I think back even to how we defeated Opportunity School District um, Amendment, Amendment 1, and it right. took a collective effort. And so that's what we're going to have to do here, um, even affect, you know, as we address the budget cuts and of course, as Lisa and I said, the F-bomb, the F-word. Yes. Um, and so, um, Lisa, do we want to like kind of leave them on a high note here? Um, I think our high note for the year is part of it is, I know for most school systems, um, summer has begun. And um, we will be asking you to keep an eye on what things are doing this summer. But take that time for yourself to rest, to relax. Um, if the beach is your place, um, find yourself a socially distanced beach uh, mm -hmm. to have that enjoyment. Um, if the mountains are your place, you might be more likely to find some way to socially distance there, but to relax and not let this become a never ending school year. Um, don't, mm -hmm. let, don't let the situation overwhelm your need to recharge because we all normally do recharge in the summer and we have to continue to do that so that we can be there for our students, no matter how we go back to school for the fall. That's it. Um, so my high note would definitely be, um, I think some districts have already started um, doing some online interviews, those virtual yeah. interviews. So congratulations to all of the uh, new educators out there. Um, I saw where people were setting up their Amazon wish list and those types of things. So feel free to set those up. Also, those of you who are leaving the profession or retiring, um, entering your new profession, uh, 
feel free to reach out to those new educators and gift them with the amazing resources that you've had um, in the profession. I would say just not just classroom teachers, school bus drivers, um, cafeteria workers, managers, those things that you may need to be an effective educator. Um, and again, as Lisa said, recharge um, and disconnect from it all and just recharge. Um, that's our high note for you today. And we love you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all. And thank you for being a member of GAE. Yes. <laughs>